You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. Hi, I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser and welcome back to NCR 507, Research Design and Interpretation. In our previous shows, we've been talking about research design and some basic foundations. Today, we're going to lay a few more foundations in place as we explore the idea of conducting great research. Now, a couple of key concepts that we're going to be working on today are to look at the measurement terms that are important to us as researchers, and then we'll do an interview where we talk about how we measure violence, and then finally, we'll talk about these basic concepts um, as they relate to the violence uh, studies that have gone on in the past. Now, the first couple of terms that we want to talk about are the terms of conceptualization and operationalization. They sound like big words, right? Well, as we talk about these words, I want to make sure that we explore the difference between the two ideas and what they mean to us in terms of research. Now, the first idea is conceptualization. And this is where we get a concept about something that we wish to study. Now, sometimes you'll hear architects say they have a concept design or a concept that they've mocked up that is basically the idea. And as we think about that, then we can think about conceptualization as that way. Of course, this is preliminary. When we talk about the concept of operationalization, we need to understand that operationalization is basically how we are going to put that measurement into action. How does it work in operation? And so when we move from conceptualization to operationalization, this is how that particular measurement will work in terms of research. Now, one idea is for us to think about if I were to build a birdhouse. I know it seems like a funny example, but I could draw a concept design like you're seeing on the screen. And it's basically the concept of what I wish to build. And with that idea, I don't have any specific plans. I just have kind of what I like, I'd like for it to look like. So when we move to operationalization, what we do is draw up specific plans. What does that mean? That to move from a concept to actually executing on an idea in research, we have to actually devise specific ways of doing something. And so that actually is a very important task for you and I as researchers. That it's one thing to talk about the idea of building the birdhouse, it's quite another thing to develop specific plans. Now, one of the things to think about is maybe another variable that we might talk about. Let's say I was thinking about how talkative someone is, like I wanted to measure that as a variable. And when I think about how talkative someone is, I could think about that as a concept, but when I want to measure how talkative someone is, that's an entirely different process. That's the operationalization. That's the idea that you and I have to operate, no, tell how our, our variable operates in that particular study. So will we measure how many words people talk about? Um, will we measure how many words that are used in a minute, a segment? Will we look at uh, perceptions of extroversion? Will we do a self-report measure where we ask someone to indicate how talkative they believe they are? All of these are different, op uh, different operationalizations of the idea of talkativity, meaning that I can measure it lots of different ways. Now, one side note, of course, is to acknowledge that when you choose something as a researcher in terms of operationalization, it is your choice. And we could criticize choices that are made in terms of operationalization, but we know that as long as you do operationalize, as long as you're specific, that is your choice to make as the researcher. Now, let's move on to a couple of other very important concepts. Our next concepts are to talk about reliability and validity. As a teacher of quantitative methods, I frequently hear the terms reliability and validity mixed up. In other words, some people use the terms actually interchangeably. It's important for us to distinguish those concepts because reliability isn't the same as validity. What reliability means is that we are taking a stable and consistent measurement of whatever it is that we're measuring. The keywords, stable and consistent. When we talk about validity, we're talking about the idea that we are capturing a valid measure of the notion we're trying to capture or the variable we're trying to capture. In other words, are you measuring what you think you're measuring? So we see those as very different ideas, but I think an example or two will help us really clarify them. So let's talk about a clock. When we think about a clock, we think it is a measurement of time. So we think about that clock as being 
um, something that is used to make that measurement of time. Now, if we consider that clock reliable, then we are considering it to be a stable, consistent measurement of time. In other words, it doesn't add seconds or subtract seconds. It keeps very good time. Now, some of you back home have some watches or clocks that don't actually work very uh, well or very reliably. And so we know that some clocks fall behind and some clocks go run too fast, we say but others are very reliable. And so those are the ones that we use when we have important appointments to make. I use my cell phone because it's very reliable. It tends to really reflect the time that we're actually um, on at that moment. Now let's talk about validity. Validity is this idea that I'm measuring what I think I'm measuring. So I could have a very stable clock, that's reliability, but it has to be actually measuring the time that we are really experiencing out in real life. What does that mean? It has to be set to the correct time. So when you think about reliability and validity, you can think of instances where they haven't matched up. For example, when we have daylight savings, you might have a very, very reliable clock. It keeps great time. It's stable, it's consistent. But if it's set to the wrong time, meaning not the daylight savings, then we know that it's not a valid indicator of time. So in order for it to be working, then we would say that the, both of those have to be matched up. Now, when I was on my way to, the, to do this taping, I thought about my Fitbit that I keep in my pocket. This is my Fitbit. And I was thinking about its measurement. And I think it's an interesting thing for us to think about related to the concept I've talked about so far. So when we think about the Fitbit, um, we could talk about the concept behind the Fitbit, right? So the concept behind the Fitbit is to measure my movements in the day and in the evening. In other words, um, how much I move. And when we talk about operationalization, then we get specific about how does my Fitbit operate and how it actually measures my movement. So let's think about that. If I press my button, it tells me how many uh, sets of stairs that I've climbed in this, in this day cycle. It tells me how many steps that I've taken. It also tells me how much distance I have traveled. And if I wear it at night, I have a special wristband that I can put it on if I want to measure how my sleep cycles. It can also measure how, many, how much movement I have when I'm sleeping, and it can be an indicator of how much I'm waking up. So that is kind of an interesting thing to think about in terms of reliability and validity. We know that it is a stable measurement. Now you might say, wait, but it's not perfect. Yeah, I wouldn't say that anything is perfect. But my question is, when you think about the Fitbit or you think about the clock, is it producing a measurement that is stable and consistent? And my answer would have to be yes. What I use the Fitbit for is to compare my activity in one day to the next. And that's a pretty interesting concept. So it's not really about whether I've done my 10,000 steps, so to speak. It's that when I know that that's my average step number that I take, I can on certain days, like today, look at my Fitbit and say, oh, it only says 6,000. That's actually some interesting measurement information. And when I get 6,000, what does it tell me? It's not really about the 4,000 steps that I haven't taken. It's to remind me of the notion that that concept, that larger idea that I'm measuring, differs from what I thought was occurring. In other words, it can measure that I thought I was actually moving a little more than I am, and I use it as an indicator when I do academic work to remind myself to move. Now, you can say the same thing's true when we talk about sleeping. So I might wear the Fitbit to measure how many times I wake up at night, but I might not realize how many times that actually is. One of the first couple of times I wore the Fitbit indicator at night, I was surprised at how much waking up I actually did. And it was a measure for me to understand that perception of movement and then actually measure it and make decisions. As we think about all of this measurement, I think it's easy to get caught up in maybe the exceptions, maybe the parts of it that aren't perfect measurement, but I don't think that's a great place to go. I think the great place to go is to say what can we learn from it and what comparisons can we make in order to inform our choices better. So one of the other concepts that we should stop and observe is the need for operationalization and validity to line up. Remember what both of those are. Operationalization is how my variables operate in the study that I'm measuring and then also validity, the idea that I'm measuring what I intend to measure. To the extent that these line up, then I have some great integrity in my study. But to the extent that operationalization and validity don't line up, it's not gonna get me very far from a research perspective. Now the next topic we want to talk about is very foundational. 
It's this idea that you and I can measure on different levels. And so as we talk about the different levels of measurement, we want to identify the four different levels of measurement. As you know, we capture data in a number of ways. One of the most basic principles is the levels of measurement used in data analysis. So let's examine the four measurement levels, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. The first distinction that you notice in this diagram is to differentiate categorical data from continuous data. By this we mean the data are collected into categories or continuous format. Next we look at each of these areas and see the specific measurement related to it. Let's start with categorical data collection and examine nominal and ordinal measurement. For nominal measurement, it means that we capture the data in name only. You might think of this as named categories. For example, individuals might identify personality tendency such as preference for expression. The choices might be extroversion or introversion. When individuals respond with their answers, those answers represent categorical information. In this case, your preference for extroversion or introversion. Another example of nominal level measurement would be to ask individuals to identify their undergraduate major. An individual could review a list of majors to check off their specific degree. In these two examples, the questions provide categorical information about the participant. In this case, it's nominal data. As you might guess, nominal data levels have limitations because it only identifies general information. Because of this, it is also mathematically limited in terms of analysis. Our next measurement level is ordinal. For ordinal measurement, it means that we capture data in categories, but that those categories are also ordered. In other words, order matters. Our example of ordinal measurement could be level of education. On a survey, we might present someone with the categorical choices of high school, college, or graduate level of education. Here we see categories, but we also note that they are in ascending order, meaning their order reflects more or less of something, in this case, education. Another example of ordinal measurement might be the indication of socioeconomic status. For example, a person might indicate low, middle, or upper class socioeconomic status, or they could list it the other way around. In both of these examples, they are ordinal because they are a collection of categorical information, but they also have a logical ordering. Both nominal and ordinal measurement are considered categorical. This means that the measurement captures categories and the assigned numbers. We also note that for this level of measurement, there can be limited variance because there are only a few categories captured. As we discuss categorical measurement, it is important to acknowledge the construction of measurement items and that they are subject to two governing rules. The items must be mutually exclusive, and second, the items must be exhaustive. First, we note that measurement must be mutually exclusive. This means that the construction of categories must be distinct and not overlap. For example, an individual responding to a survey should have only one place to mark. Multiple answers should not apply to an individual. And if this is the case, the researcher should revise the item because it could yield non-comparable data. Second, we note that measurement must be exhaustive. This means that there must be enough categories available to capture all of the data. In other words, an individual responding to a survey should have a place to put his or her answer. Having no place to mark an answer also indicates a violation of the standard of exhaustive categories. It indicates a need for revision of those categories. Now let's explore continuous data measurement. We consider continuous data to be superior to categorical data because it captures more variance and has more options for analysis. The first type of continuous data is interval. Interval level data is classified as being in a logical order with the presence of equal intervals but no absolute zero. For example, an institution might be interested in determining academic training. The researchers might decide that the SAT test is an indicator of training. So individual SAT scores are considered interval. And this is because these scores are equal intervals but don't have an absolute zero. Specifically, the scores are equal in their distances because we know that when something is numbered mathematically, those numbers are equally distant from each other. 
But we also know that when someone takes the SAT, there is no available zero score available on the SAT test. The lowest score on the SAT test is 400, not an absolute zero. So even if an individual missed every item on the SAT test, the lowest score would be 400. Another example is the Amazon star rating system. This is used by individuals to rate products, and scores from multiple raters are added together to create average ratings on a particular product on Amazon. Note this has equal intervals. The distance from a three-star rating to a four-star rating is the same distance as a four-star rating is to a five-star rating. We know the stars are equally distant from each other. But we know also that the measurement does not have an absolute zero available, meaning the lowest available rating on Amazon is a one-star rating. Our last level of measurement is ratio measurement. Ratio level data are classified as being in logical order with the presence of equal intervals, but also an absolute zero. Let's suppose that an agency was interested in determining financial need for assistance. The researchers might decide income as an indicator of financial need. Income is considered ratio because it involves numbers, so equal distances, but also has the presence of an absolute zero. Zero income is an available choice. A final example of ratio measurement might be determining work experience. The researcher might decide that years of service is an indicator of work experience. Years of service is considered ratio because it involves numbers, so equal distances, as well as the presence of an absolute zero. Zero years of service is a possible choice. Now in review, we have seen four levels of measurement used in quantitative research methods, N, O, I, R. We see nominal, categorical measurement in name only, where order doesn't matter, ordinal, categorical measurement where order does matter, interval, continuous measurement with equal intervals, and ratio, continuous measurement with equal intervals and an absolute zero. As we conclude, an easy way to remember the levels of measurement in their proper order is to think about the wine Pinot Noir. The NOIR, N-O-I-R, gives us an acronym to keep the levels of measurement in their proper order and helps us to remember them. In the, in the end, we know that the collection of certain variables of data yields different information, different levels of variance, and the ability of the researcher to explore more and less options of analysis based on these data. Our next topic is to start to talk about the conceptualization of violence. And to do that, we want to talk about a program of research. This program of research comes from George Gerbner. And there have been about 500 studies that have come out of this, what we really think of today as a paradigm of media study. It's the idea of cultivation theory. And when we talk about cultivation theory, we want to talk about some of the central ideas that are related to cultivation theory. Um, we look at the four decades of research, over 500 studies. Um, we even recently saw a great publication from Morgan Shanahan and Signorielli in 2014 that just reviewed this giant, massive amount of research. What does that research collectively tell us? Um, the main tenets of the theory, and then what have been all of those research studies um, in their total contribution. So we start with the idea that in this cultivation idea, that television is the main storyteller. And in fact, the notion that television cultivates reality. Another notion that we talk about are the three main components of cultivation theory. One, that basically television is there to make money. So when we talk about institutional processes that underlie the media, we have to talk about money. We also talk about prevalent images in the media. And then lastly, we talk about relationships between the media and the audience behaviors and beliefs. You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. So the next clip that we're about to watch shows Gerbner himself talking about this theory and gives us a central idea of the components that are about cultivation theory. Let us start our story at the very beginning with story itself. The most distinctive characteristic of human beings as a species is that we are the storytelling animal. For the longest time in human history, stories were told face to face in the community, uh, in the tribe, uh, in the family. And for many uh, hundreds of thousands of years, that was the only thing that is possible. 
course there was also imagery, monuments like pyramids or obelisks or murals, cathedrals, they're all images and they're designed to create a sense of awe or a sense of understanding of nature or of power. This is the true magic of human life, that the stories by and through which we live are the stories that animate us, that make us seek certain things and fear other things. And for a very long time, this magic was tightly controlled. It was controlled by what we now recognize as the priesthood, as some kind of a priesthood or a tribal chief. And then, at a certain point in history, it all changes. It changes when we reach the Industrial Revolution. When the printing press is combined with the steam engine to make rapid printing possible, uh, to make the spread of literacy a virtual necessity, that presents the Industrial Revolution in storytelling. Where shall I go when I go where I go? From that point on, there are corporations that mass produce stories and create a new kind of entity called the public. This is crucial to understand that it is the mass production of stories and of messages and of images disseminated to millions of people who could never be reached face to face by the same source. And by doing that, they establish a loose aggregation of people who have nothing in common except the publications they share. The second major change, a change that is still accelerating, is the electronic revolution. And the mainstream of the new electronic revolution is television. After 10 years of experiment, television, first shown to the public at the World's Fair, now takes its place as a new American art and industry. Uh, we have to recognize that television ushers in a new age. Atop a million homes, antennas pluck the pictures from the sky. At a flick of a switch or the turn of a dial, the scene reappears on the television screen. Fantastic. But our children will grow up with this miracle enriching their lives and giving them a new understanding of the whole world. Gosh. For Gerbner, here's what mattered most about all of this. This amazing new storytelling force was conceived from the start as a way to sell things. By television, American business has found a most effective advertising medium. And in turn, advertising has provided the resources that sustain the standards of programming and permit the never-ending research that is the heart of the television industry. The broadcast airwaves may belong to the public, but television in the U.S. was funded from the start almost entirely by advertising. It was private companies, not public tax dollars as in Great Britain and other parts of the world, that bankrolled network TV programs in the U.S. So from the beginning, the primary function of TV shows was to attract large numbers of people to see the advertisements of the businesses that paid for the programs. For the first time in human history, most of the stories, most of the time, to most of the children are told no longer by the parent, no longer by the school, no longer by the church, no longer by the community, no longer handcrafted, no longer community-based, no longer historically inspired, inherited, going from generation to generation, but essentially by a small group of global conglomerates that really have nothing to tell them but have a lot to say. Let's go! From the very beginning, people have no role other than as products who are attracted to a particular program, which in effect is the bait. And boys and girls, for the very first time, we all started to eat Wonder Bread at all our meals, breakfast, lunch. Tea. Those audiences are the audiences who are most likely to be the consumers of a particular kind of product. America's best-selling, best-tasting filter cigarette. It still tastes good like a cigarette should. And then the advertiser, in turn, pays for producing the program. From the very beginning, the public is what is bought and sold. There's one for you, and there's one for you, Joe. It certainly was a fine first round. Well, you know, 
everybody's buying more and more. And out of this comes an inescapable and highly pervasive cultural environment not produced essentially to sell. Brought to you by Coca-Cola. For Gerbner, the commercial nature of this environment was fundamental. Say it. When you call, I want you to say, I'm making a thousand dollar vow of faith. Say the word, thousand dollars. Say it. Operating as businesses first, media corporations present a certain kind of world. A world built to sell. Offering up a distinct brand of reality shaped by the demands of the marketplace. Everything else stems from this commercial logic, from the fundamental fact that private corporations decide what fills the public airwaves. Today, a handful of global conglomerates own and control the telling of all the stories in the world. They have global marketing formulas that are imposed on the creative people in Hollywood, and I, I'm in touch with them, and they hate it. They say, don't talk to me about censorship from Washington. I never heard about that. I get censorship every day. I'm told, put in more action, cut out complicated solutions. They apply this formula because it travels well in the global market. These are formulas that need no translation, and essentially image-driven, that speak action in any language, and of course the leading element of that formula is violence. As you can see, Gerbner analyzes what individuals who consume television start to believe about the world. And central to that idea is this concept of the mean and scary world. Now this next clip takes a look at the mean and scary world syndrome. You always have to look over your shoulder. A lot of times you might feel uneasy if somebody's walking by you. You feel like you're always like on guard. To get a handle on what Gerbner means by the mean world syndrome, it's not enough to analyze individual TV programs or films or video games. The entire media context is what matters. How one kind of story or program blends into another to create and reinforce a distinct view and sense of the world. Getting to the heart of the mean world syndrome then requires taking a look at TV the way most of us experience it at home, when we're not in classrooms thinking about these things, by simply picking up the remote and doing a little channel surfing. When we do, with every change of the channel, we're likely to see the most banal content, alternating with the most bizarre and violent and frightening so that what would be shocking in our real lives in the media world comes to seem normal and mundane, reinforcing the sense that the world is a place of constant danger and threat. I have to do what I can to protect myself and my children. And that's a fact of life, a way of life. What cultivation analysis has done is to show how these kinds of anxieties and insecurities are caught up explicitly with media culture uncovering a direct correlation between the amount of television one watches and the level of fear one has of being victimized. If you look at it from a cultivation point of view, you see that the image of victimization, the image of risk, the image of danger, the conception that if there is so much violence in the world, I'm, I'm at risk. Not that I'm going to go down the street to be a mugger, but on the contrary, I'm afraid to go down the street at night. I'm afraid to go into the subways. I'm afraid uh, of strangers. I try to cross the street when I see somebody that I think may be dangerous to me. These are the, the consequences of exposure to violence that are cultivated in large communities over long periods of time. The finding that if you watch a lot of TV, you're likely to be more afraid of violence than those who watch less TV may help explain why so many people seem to think violent crime is far worse than it actually is. A widespread misperception that started to be noticed a decade ago when crime rates began to drop. Here is the reality. Violent crime per capita actually dropped slightly in the latest figures released by the Justice Department. Nationwide, murder was down 5%. But the perception continues to dominate reality, triggering a fear that is out of sync with statistics. A fear that no one and no place is safe anymore. And when you're always on guard, it's hard to let go of fear, no matter what the reality. And this classic example of the mean world syndrome continues today. In fact, 
Since that ABC News report about falling crime rates, Justice Department figures show that violent crime has dropped an additional 43% to a remarkable 30-year low. Anderson, the FBI says violent crime dropped 2.5% in 2008. Now, that includes an overall 4.4% decline in murders. But despite the steady drop, polls have consistently shown that most Americans believe just the opposite to be true, that crime has actually been increasing. Three quarters of Americans say there is more crime in the United States than there was a year ago. Gallup's annual crime poll shows it's the highest level since the early 1990s. The poll also finds 51% of Americans say there is more crime in their local area than there was a year ago. The logical question is why? Why do fear and anxiety about violence seem to be rising even when the threat of violence is falling? Well, surveys consistently show that upwards of two-thirds of the people who believe crime to be a very serious personal problem say they get most of their news from television. This is the breakthrough of cultivation analysis, a clear correlation between the amount of media we consume and the degree of fear and anxiety we have about the world. As we can see in the video, there are some very compelling pieces of information in this four decade research program. So one of our tasks today is to explore the concept of violence and the related media effects more specifically in terms of the measurement. So we'll be back in a few minutes to speak with Dr. Christina Dermy, who is a media effects specialist to explore these concepts. We'll be right back. You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Many of our brothers feel like they're a part of a family, whether it's the culture, uh, color of the skin, or just being comfortable with other men. The bond keeps growing, and the brotherhood keeps strengthening itself through those means. The Male Success Alliance at Cal State Dominguez Hills is creating a genuine brotherhood. It does not force you to be anything. It does not require you to be a certain type of student. We're here emotionally, physically, and any time a brother needs anything, we're going to be there. A lot of times, men of color aren't seen as professional, or you don't even see them in professional settings. So the Male Success Alliance is trying to get our men ready within their undergrad to be in that professional setting because they are the professional. The manner that the program is doing this is through the concentration of being there for our brothers. The practical way of doing that is, you know, redefining and strengthening the brotherhood, you know, within the campus and through the workshops and different events that we have. The suit is that signal that we're trying to create. You know, that whole changing the narrative is coming through the suit. When a man is able to be clean, they feel good. It gives us confidence and it oozes out of the guys. Watching Dr. Franklin and Matt Smith, you know, walk around in these nice suits, it's like, hey, I wanna, I wanna be like that. I wanna be him one day. I wanna be able to wear that nice suit. And you see it, it, it the results are better academics, uh, more social, a uh, better social life. And a lot of guys just wanna be a part of the program because of it. The Mel Success Alliance found me in a very interesting time place, trying to balance classes and my home life. I started to really fail in many ways. I found MSA on my verge of not being a student anymore. Meeting the actual student body president of the Mel Success Alliance, I met him and it was like, nah brother, you're, you are my brother and anything you need from me, just let me know. And that's what MSA is built on. How, do, how does each one teach one and how do we bring our brothers along with us? And that's why MSA sets that legacy in terms of, it's not just about CSU Dominguez Hills, it's this region, it's this state, and it's the nation. And these young men are gonna change all of them. My name is Alex Guerrero, and I'm a Toro. My name is James Harris, and I'm a Toro. I'm Jordan Sylvester, and I'm a Toro.
You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Christina Dermy, Media Effects Specialist, and I'm here to speak with her about cultivation theory and to talk about the measurement issues related to cultivation theory. Welcome to the show, Christina. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, we wanted to hear your opinion on cultivation theory and kind of, I guess the first place to start is to talk about like what is cultivation? What is cultivation? Well, the cultivation theory itself is a mass media effects theory, which basically argues that um, television as the primary cultural storytelling force of our time cultivates certain ideas and beliefs about the world that we live in. Okay, so beginning there, we have an understanding that television is, is of utmost importance okay. to our society and to our understanding of the world around us, especially when we don't have direct experience or direct contact with certain groups of people, etc. So the theory basically says that um, the more television a person watches, the more likely they are to adopt the beliefs about reality from the content that they're seeing on TV. Okay. okay? So it stands to reason then if we are watching television and television content is full of violence, for example, then heavy viewers of television are going to be more likely to adopt the belief that the world is a very violent place. Okay. So in a nutshell, that's what cultivation theory is about. Okay, so that concept of cultivation, uh, how is that different from like transmission? Because I'm kind of wonder about like if I watch a show and then I think something like what's the sure. difference around the, the cultivation idea? Well, that's a great question. And it's not like if I binge watch Game of Thrones for a week, suddenly I'm going to either act very violent or feel like the world is a scary, violent place. But cultivation means that this is a very gradual, slow, okay. yet pervasive process. Okay. So this will happen over a number of years, and it will happen based on the amount of television content we consume. So over time, gradually, we will cultivate a belief about the way that the world is. Okay, so the cultivation then is that this notion doesn't just get a transmitted uh, element into like my thinking and belief pattern and behavior, but right. that it grows out of exactly. that exposure. That's okay, exactly right, over time. Okay, mm -hmm. and then the main tenets of the theory, so we have cultivation, what are the other, we talk about the mean scary world, um, right. and a couple other um, ideas. So basically the entire cultural environment project um, had three prongs, and the first one was the institutional process analysis. And here is a part of Gerbner's research where he wanted to really get behind the media itself as an entity and to look at what drives the media to produce the content that they produce. And of course, we know that there is a bottom line mentality that exists in the media, mm -hmm. and it is a for profit institution, so that we absolutely, or they have a concern for making money. Okay. So the first thing that he looks at then is um, because we know the media wants to make money, what kind of content are they going to produce that will ensure that they do make money? Okay. Okay. So that's the first thing that we're looking at. And the way that he addresses that is by saying, um, or arguing towards there being a lot of violent content, is by saying that the media is likely to create content that is violent because it's easy to transmit to other countries. Okay. So from a global perspective, it's cheaper and easier. You don't have to translate violence. Everybody knows what violence is and what a car explosion looks like or um, what murder looks like, mm -hmm. et cetera. So um, it's easy to then sell that to foreign countries. So. That's kind of the institutional process. So that's part. where violence gets like a prominent place Correct. because of that portability. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly okay. right. So then the second part or prong is the message system analysis. And this is where he really gets into the um, quantitative content analysis portion of it, where he wants to discover exactly what are we seeing on TV? What is the content mm -hmm. that is prevalent there? Um, and when are we watching it? And et cetera, et cetera. The last part is the cultivation analysis, and that is the part that is now really looking at whether or not his hypothesis is correct. And that is where he says that 
people who are heavy viewers of television content are more likely to perceive that the world is going to be a very mean and scary place because of the amount of violence that they've seen. Because the violence is the main content. Because the violence is the main content. And then the consumption of that plants the seed that cultivates the belief and viewpoint. That's it, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. So then um, you talked about kind of some measurement ideas. And so one of the questions to ask you is, um, when we think about the measurement, like how did they do some of these measurements? What kind of measurements would you tell us about? Okay. Well, for, uh, to begin with, the quantitative content analysis portion of it um, he had to conceptualize a definition of what violence is to begin mm -hmm. with in order to be able to train coders so that they could go in and watch television content and determine what was violent and what was not. Right. So do you want me to give you a definition? Sure, Okay. Sure. So he defined violence as, and I quote, the overt expression of physical force with or without a weapon against self or others compelling action against one's will on pain of being hurt, killed, or threatened as part of the plot. So okay. there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, um, very much so. A few of the things about that definition is it does not include verbal abuse. Okay, so idle threats and maybe mm -hmm. yelling and aggressive behavior mm -hmm. is not included. It also does not include uh, physical violence. I mean, it does include, excuse me, vis physical violence found in cartoons. Okay. Okay, so he decided to also include Saturday morning children's programming from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. in his analysis. Okay. Um, and then finally, it does also count auto crashes and natural disasters because his point was someone's being hurt or killed regardless mm -hmm. of how they're being hurt mm -hmm. or killed. Mm -hmm. So it still cultivates that fear that we have about as soon as I step outside of the house, right. something could happen to me, something horrible could happen to me. So they conceptualize the, the violence this way and then they operationalize it to special coding uh, elements or features where coders go on to watch this programming and figure out uh, the incidences, I guess, is what we would say, right? That's right. And so they were doing, my understanding is they were doing that between 7 and 11 on primetime blocks, right? Yes. And they were doing it over the 40 years, kind of every primetime season, and then also included that Saturday yes. capture. Yes. Okay. For the first 20 years when Gerbner was heading up this research himself, he would take one full week every fall season and every network show between some some estimates say 7 to 11 some say 8 to 11 primetime tv pm um, would videotape every single network program that was on and then he would like you said train coders with his definition of what violence is mm -hmm. and ask them to mark down every time they saw a violent incident take place okay okay so that's basically the notion that we could try to quantify the incidences of violence and then get sort of a, I don't know, a measurement around this uh, notion, are, are violent acts really occurring in the media and to what extent? So we could see right. the measurement over the 40 years, which is pretty interesting exactly. as a metric to yes. say, we have this much compared to last year, compared to the next year it's and incredible. all that. It's yeah. incredible. Um, one comment that I would make honestly about the, the coders is that sometimes when we talk about coding, uh, a lot of people will make criticisms of the coding and say, gosh, it's not very reliable, something we're talking about actually in this episode. And one of the comments that I would make is that it's actually very difficult to achieve what we call inner rater reliability. So these coders inside this project or inside this program of research have to achieve very high levels of agreement in the violence that they're seeing. And then we subtract mathematically chance from that. So the number that you might see, which is already a great number of agreement, is actually reflective of even a higher first level of agreement. In other words, we may get like a 90% agreement on our coding or 95 and then lower it slightly due to chance. But the comment that I would make as any of us consume any kind of data on intercoder reliability would be to observe that it is very, actually very hard to achieve. And so I consider it a strength of the Gerbner research to say this heavy training that oh, they were going through and, yes. and repeating it over yes, and over absolutely. is pretty defensible. Like yes, it, it really, well, yes, that is what allows it to be such a significant finding right. at the end of the day is because they were pretty rigorous in the way that they yeah. developed this methodology. Right. So, yes. 
So we talked about um, this idea of viewership, so the heavy and the light viewer. Oh, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's part of the theory. And my question is, are there, what are the standards for that? When okay. we operationalize that concept, like what um, are the hours and then what mm -hmm. happens if I don't maybe make those hours exactly? Yeah, yeah. that's a really important question because the way that he distinguishes heavy viewers from light viewers is through hours watched. So for a heavy viewer, he would say that anyone who watches four or more hours of TV a day is considered to be a television type or a heavy viewer. Okay. Anyone who watches less than two hours of television a day would be considered a light viewer. Okay. And so what he was interested in was getting the comparison between the heavy viewers and the light viewers and whether or not you know, their ideas about the world were being cultivated through TV. Okay, so then what I hear you saying is this notion that essentially viewership would act as like an independent variable. We'd have the heavy viewer group, yes. we've had the light viewer group, and we're looking at the perception of violence exactly. between those two groups, like the comparison. That's right. Okay, and so that's where we get what we saw in the video, which is, hey, these numbers don't match up. Right, exactly. With what the with actual, what is actually, happening actually occurring, in society, yeah, yes. okay. Okay, but even though we're still seeing the high incidence of violence on television, it doesn't match the high or low incidence in society, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. No, as the video mentioned, we, over the past 30 years, have consistently seen crime rates, violent crime rates, actually go down, while the perception to the public, especially for a heavy viewer, mm -hmm. is that violent crime is going up. Right. And there has to be a reason for that. And this is the argument that the reason is because of the amount of TV that they're watching. Right. And one of the things to observe, too, is that this research, while you saw it kind of cut off in that study at 2010 um, on, the, on the video, and then you heard my cite, source citation of 2014, um, those are matching the domination of television as a media format, yes. mm -hmm. whereas we will talk in a minute about some of the changing elements in our world, but part of why we give you those older stats is to match it with the, all the project and program research going on in Gerbner's paradigm. Exactly. That's correct. Right. Okay. Um, but we actually are seeing that even though, I mean, I, I, the direction you're going is talking about the changes in media. And like, oh, yeah. Um, but still, television is the primary mm -hmm. media platform that most Americans will participate in. Okay. It remains in 2017 to still be television. Wow. Yes. So Over 60%. Okay. So uh, something I just am thinking about now, what about movies in all of this? Like, yes. Is that part of this program of research? I think, yeah. When Gerbner does this original study, he does reference movies quite okay. a bit, especially because they have that important um, ability to be transported globally. Yeah. Because movies are a very huge industry, especially Western movies. So, yes, movies are included in, the, in as, as part of it, yes. Okay. Because I would think that that would be, when we talk mm -hmm. about portability, it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, measuring violence. Yeah. Um, so he's measuring viewership that one way. Um, yes. What about the perception of violence? Like, thoughts on the measurement there? Uh, which part are you talking about? Well, I, you know, there's a couple of different things. I guess I'll comment and then maybe ask you a question. Sure. Um, I know that they at one point did, and they're... Okay, there's over 500 studies in this area, so it's obviously we can't refer to any one. We can talk about some similarities between all of the different research articles. But um, one um, early aspect they were doing in the 70s was looking at the rate of victimization. In other words, oh, they yeah. would give people, so for example, methodologically, they would give individuals 40 pictures, and they would say put them into two stacks, the group of those who do the murdering and the group of people who are likely to be murdered. And so one of the things that we learned um, from that methodology was they found very consistent patterns, which is pretty interesting. Consistent patterns of those who are doing the murdering are young males, mm -hmm. and those who are being oh, yeah. killed, females and older males. And that was a pretty strong result that was repeated many times. So that's a, that process of replication. Um, this idea that the perception of being uh, a victim of, of crime is reflected in that. So. Um, what are your thoughts related to like media in terms of, of that? Yes, I think that that is a, an extremely important finding and that um, one of the things that Gerbner discovered through his cultivation analysis, the last part of it, was that um, 
certain groups are going to be grossly underrepresented. Okay. And you talked about women as being one of these groups and their feelings of being victimized or mm -hmm. whether or not they were going to be victimized. And what interestingly he found through this research is that minorities are vastly underrepresented and when they actually are represented in television, they're often seen as being the victim okay. or the perpetrator of the violence. So basically there's a kind of symbolic double jeopardy going on yeah. here where yeah. we're not as a society learning or understanding anything about minority groups or about women mm. as a minority group except for what we're seeing on television and if television is showing these groups as being perpetrators or victims of violence then we begin to think mm, that yeah actually wow yeah that they really don't have much of an experience in society and so are we it's sort of filling in the blanks of what we don't know about like a minority group, so to speak? Yes. And then the media is our educator. Egg, that's, a, oh, that's a perfect way to put it because you have to try to imagine we're in an area that's fairly diverse, of course. Um, but for many people in this country, they are mm -hmm. not. And so right. if they're heavy viewers and their only exposure to minority groups is through what they see on television, imagine right. the images that they conjure of these groups and why they hmm. think the way that they think. Okay. So yes, it's absolutely an educator. So as we look at worldview, um, we can see how they conceptualized it and then operationalized it. And so I guess I understand the connection of worldview and then this idea of it being related or unrelated to our beliefs. But it sort of begs a, maybe an earlier question, which is, do we watch something on TV and do it? Like, is there that kind of a modeling, so to speak, kind of idea? And of course, and that's a great question. And yes, I mean, for a long time, there was early mass media research that felt like we have something to fear when our children watch television because if they see violent content on TV, then they're going to be more likely to actually enact that violent behavior, which in fact has been disproven since then and mm -hmm. really goes kind of against what Cultivation mm -hmm. was saying because the belief that the, mean, that the world is a mean and scary place supersedes us actually behaving in a violent way. So social modeling said that we, we, we could watch what we saw and then actually behave that way. Mm -hmm. Now, further down the line, as more research was done, what they found was that it is true there is a connection between seeing violence on television and feeling aggressive okay. later. Okay. okay. So there is a definite correlation mm -hmm. there, but it's not so much that we're going to go out and enact a violent behavior as a result of watching right. TV. Right. So that's kind of interesting related to the crime statistics, because that kind of proves it as well, yes. to say, if we really thought that, then we would have seen an uh, uptick. You know, if our exactly. programming has that, we yes. would have seen an uptick st statistically and not a downturn that over is an time, excellent right? Excellent point. Yes. So, and some of what happens there, just to talk about the methods side again, um, we do analyses like that using what's called meta analysis often, mm -hmm. which is where we take not just one study, but we take all of the data and findings in multiple studies and add them together to make much larger um, conclusions, which is really necessary in this kind of a theory. Yes, right? it is. It's, and there, there have been a, several giant. of them done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's very important. All right. So let's talk about flaws. Uh, we have to talk right. about flaws in measurement. We know every measurement is flawed, probably, involving humans. Um, what are some flaws you see in this program? Well, there are several, and you know, several that have been cited by other researchers as well. Um, one of the things was about the content itself and the idea that why did Gerbner decide to lump all genres of primetime TV content together when there are obvious differences between like mm -hmm. a sitcom, for example, and a drama, right. which are both shown during primetime TV. So some mm -hmm. researchers felt like, well, those should be separate things. Um, also, there was some criticism about non-random methods of selecting respondents. Okay. There was also some criticism about the self-report data of having people tell us whether or not they were a heavy viewer, a light viewer, a moderate viewer. Right, right. Um, above all that, I think probably mm -hmm. the biggest thing was an, some people believe there was an over-reliance on his causal explanation that heavy viewing okay. causes mean world syndrome. Right, because if they're doing correlation data, then obviously they can't make that causal connection. Exactly. Of course, they can try to do it in multiple regression models, uh, assign causality, same with um, structural equation modeling. 
So these are later studies in the system and obviously are going to use better metrics. Um, one thing we talked about you know, earlier in the show is this idea of levels of measurement. And of course, you can see um, some categories, categorical variables and also continuous variables appear here. And one of the, the, the items that occurs to me as you're talking about the classification of viewership mm -hmm. is we got better at figuring that out on a continuous measure than Absolutely. classifying it as just categorical, high, you know, heavy versus light. Right. But to be fair, when you're doing difference testing, you have to have groups, right? So you take the ends and you yeah. compare the ends, mm -hmm. which does make sense. It does. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing to think from a method standpoint. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is a TV viewership uh, theory mm -hmm. or, or paradigm, however big you want to classify it. Yes. Um, so my question is, do you believe this operates the same way in social media now? Like, where are we today? Because I, like you said, that still we see television as the main storyteller. We do. I mean, that's true from your specialty. My question is, gosh, it seems like there's a lot of other screens out there that aren't oh, television. And there so. sure are. And recent research through um, the Kaiser Family Foundation has found that we spend 70% of our waking hours in front of some type of a screen. Oh, wow. So if it's not television, it's the internet, or it's our mobile phone, or it's a video game, or it's some yeah. other type of media platform. Um, so it's critically important to continue the examination of cultivation mm -hmm. analysis and to see wh what is changing now mm -hmm. that media consumption is changing. Right. Um, so the question, do I believe that it would operate the same way in social media is a very tricky one. <laughs> That's and where I'm going. <laughs> it's very tricky and I would answer yes and mm. no. Okay. Um, if we believe that what we see on the internet at large it is um, storytelling, it, if it is narrative about what's going on in mm -hmm. our culture, then yes, I think that it could ultimately, for people who consume a vast amounts of the internet, mm -hmm. could definitely have a cultivation effect take place. But we, social media in particular, um, is more interpersonal than mass media. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it that way, I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure yet. But research is being done currently yeah. on social media and the internet and on content of the internet, which is critically important. Um, but television is still still the, the number one most important thing because no matter how they're accessing television, mm -hmm. because it can be through the internet, it can right. be through your mobile phone, it can be, we're still watching television. So Right. I'm just thinking about the enormous task of coding content on the internet. I I, I'm not, not even sure even how you, of course you I can randomly imagine. select content mm -hmm. and format and... Yes. And, you know, Topical amount of use and, and yeah, yeah, all these things. But I'm right. wondering how you even begin that kind of task. It seems pretty yes. crazy to yes. try to I capture. I think it's going to take very slow <laughs> steps and yeah. a really extensive research program to actually topically look at different genres that are being presented on the internet and then to try to analyze it that right. way. So it seems like sort of a gift when you have Gerbner's research, it actually is helpful that we don't have social media at that same time right. operating as a prominent factor yes. because all of a sudden we lose all these other variables exactly. that you're saying are now added into this equation, That's which right. is what makes it complicated. Yes. Um, I guess the thing I'm, and you can comment on this, um, but I, I sort of wonder about the, I understand the mean and scary world, and I understand that that's still a notion that a lot of people have, you know, about mm, violence. Absolutely. I'm certainly, our world of terrorism hasn't helped either, that's right? Because right. we see that, you know, which we probably could do just studies on that. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the questions that I wonder about is when we think about these kind of theory and research applications in social media, will we find that it's not a mean and scary world, it's a mean and isolated world? Because it seems like a lot of these ideas are more about me or mm -hmm. my own self in participation in social Absolutely. media versus like the collective thinking. Yeah. I don't know. Thoughts I on that? I think that's very interesting. And as producers now of mass media, if you will, not just consumers, mm -hmm. we do have a significant responsibility. And I think at the end of the day, interpersonally, what we're all really after is connection and attachment mm -hmm. and feeling as part of a community. Right. And I think with social media, that is so much of what people are striving to achieve is approval and community and attachment. <laughs> Yet 
like you say, it's having it. an opposite yeah. effect where we're feeling even more isolated mm -hmm. than we were prior to yeah. our use of social media. Hmm. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with yeah. this media. Very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thank insights you. on cultivation and, and all of the other theories related to it. Um, we appreciate your help and um, thank you for coming on the show. Why, thank you for having me. You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. So now to circle back on the concepts we started with, it is important for us to think about Gerbner's line of research, and really we call it a program of research because it is so extensive, but it's great because we can look at the concepts and ideas that we've talked about earlier in the show to see how they work in action. So let's start with conceptualization. Initially, when Gerbner started his research, he started with the concept of what is violence? What are media effects? What are the reasons, perhaps, that someone may or may not be violent? And then what do people believe about this violence? Now, when he went into practice is where we get into the idea of operationalization. That's the notion that when I want to measure these concepts of viewership, when I want to measure the concepts of um, any aspect of my study, I have to make some distinctions about how I plan to do that. And so we saw um, some interesting measurement uh, decisions in this line of research, and of course we know there's many in the 500 studies, or more than 500 studies, but how we are measuring uh, television as a self-report item, um, how we are writing down different measurements in terms of perception. Um, we talked about victimization, we talked about all kinds of different um, areas in that theory and research um, area to kind of identify um, some decisions the researcher had made. Now let's talk about reliability and validity. One comment that I made partway through that interview is to talk about how difficult it is to get intercoder reliability. Um, let me also talk about um, survey reliability. So when we do self-reported information, when we do composite um, variable analysis where we're taking multiple items and, and taking composite scores based on those multiple items, um, we can add those things together and get these composite scores. But one thing to know is that we can actually mathematically ask computers to analyze the reliability of those items. And so what it does is it looks mathematically at the sequencing of answering to see if our respondent is actually reliable or consistent in his or her responses. And what happens is it, is, uh, it helps the researcher to be able to see the actual reliability of like a survey instrument. Now one of the main tests that we use for that is Cronbach's Alpha. And Cronbach's Alpha is a, basically a way for us to see what is the actual reliability of something that we use in survey design. And so we'll talk about more about that idea in the future, but one comment is to see that that was, of course, used in Gerbner's um, reliability. Also, we talked about intercoder reliability, and that's kind of another kind of reliability where two or more coders look at the same phenomenon, in the case of Gerbner's, looking at different aspects of violence and making coded um, recordings of what they're seeing. And what I had observed previously was how difficult that is to get those numbers to be high. So what I hear all the time from students is that they are so surprised at the numbers being 80% or that kind of level of agreement when we talk about intercoder reliability. And the comment I would make is, it's hard to get great reliability. So actually, that is pretty impressive. In terms of validity, we have to kind of think about this notion that when we think of Gerdner's research, um, it is valid to the extent that we are actually measuring that item. And so some people might have said that with the self-report measure of viewership, for example. This idea that, is that valid if I ask somebody to tell not how much they actually were watching, but how much they think they were watching? Um, I would say that is an interesting question, but I would also probably, if I were on a team of researchers analyzing um, these decisions, I would say, if you put people on opposite ends, however, that is probably valid in that most people who identify on the ends of a spectrum tend to have um, you know, better validity in terms of that. Now let's talk about levels of measurement. We talked about nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. Let's just put them in two camps. We'll say there's categorical data, there's continuous data. We talked about the idea that categorical data only tells us different um, 
things that we know about the categories versus continuous data gives us all that variance to play with so we can look at um, relationships and, uh, and other complicated, um, I don't know, more, more precise measures um, inside of those continuous measures. So one of the um, applications to note is that we look at an obvious categorical variable in Gerbner's research, and that's that light and heavy viewer. You can see the categories there. And then we also see that as an independent variable used to look for differences. And one that we observed in the interview was this perception of violence or perception of possible victim victimization, I guess is what they called it, is um, does that differ between the two groups? And so what are you essentially doing from a measurement level? You have victimization as a continuous measure. So you get like an average score. And you have an average score for those who are in the light viewership compared to the average score of those who are in the heavy viewership. And so as you think about it, then what we are looking for, is there a significant difference? This is one of the most consistent findings that Gerbner found in, in so many of those studies, not all conducted by him, but, but certainly replicated. This idea that our perceptions are very different, um, our perceptions of victimization are very different uh, between the light and the heavy viewership. So those are two interesting examples about levels of measurement, and we can make those comparisons. Um, let's see. So then uh, the last comment to make is one that we haven't talked about yet, and that is the null hypothesis. And it would be important for us to observe that related to Gerbner's research to say that when we think about the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis essentially is essentially the notion that there is no difference. So if I were testing those two group averages like we just talked about a second ago, it tests, when we do the statistical test, we're testing against the idea that those aren't any different. Now, a minute ago, I said we found a lot of evidence to see that they are significantly different. But we want to observe, we test against the notion that nothing's there. And that's why you keep hearing me use the word significantly different. Because when it is actually like a real difference, or it's special, we call it significant. And we're gonna talk about that more in future episodes. So today we've talked about a number of different concepts and um, really laid a great foundation uh, for research design. We've talked about conceptualization and operationalization. We've talked about reliability and validity. We've talked about measurement levels. Uh, and then we took all of those ideas and looked at the Gerbner's program of research uh, regarding media effects, um, television, and violence. And then at the end, we were able to wrap up by looking at all of those things related and see all of them in action. So as we think about uh, today, I think one takeaway is to say, it's not just understanding the concepts or the ideas initially, but it's seeing how they're used in real research. And when we look at Gerbner's research, we see an excellent example of a very comprehensive program. Um, one that is actually honestly not seen very often. In other words, we don't see usually studies that are replicated over 40 years. We don't see uh, researchers sticking with uh, these research plans and intentions. So um, very rare and very impressive indeed. Well, thank you for joining me today on the program. Um, this is Dr. Pamela Kreiser wishing you not just a day that's different, but a day that is significantly different.